It's a rundown corner in Philadelphia, South Philly specifically, a hallmark of drugs, gangs, and danger. And Marvin Greer is on the move with three friends alongside him. All four of them belong to the same gang, one of countless throughout Philadelphia in the 1960s. The block is clear when they see a young boy pop out around the corner from an enemy gang. The boy sees the group of four and instantly runs for his life, but he's too late. Within seconds, the group of four is on top of the young boy, beating him relentlessly. Marvin Green, just 17 years old at the time, pulls out a four inch pearl knife from his back pocket. In this instant, blade in his hand, Marvin Greer is faced with an adrenaline fueled anger-induced choice, a choice to change his life. Marvin Greer stabs the boy in the back four times, killing him, and flees the scene. Soon after, he would plead guilty to second-degree murder. Five years later, in 1974, at the age of 22, Marvin Greer would mysteriously pass away. There was no mention of his death in newspapers, and it was officially listed as natural causes. Natural causes? At 22 years old? I don't think so. This is to say that the death of Marvin Greer is a complete mystery. Before Greer died though, he would father three different young boys. These young boys would all go on to replicate their father's decisions in some way. The oldest of the boys was Marvin Harrison. Harrison was a quiet recluse to the public and would eventually make the NFL, becoming the right-hand man of Peyton Manning and reaching the Hall of Fame with his name plastered all over the record books. But more about Harrison soon, because there's a lot more. The middle child was Marquan Gordon, a Philly street hustler who worked his way to top ranks in the African-American Mafia. He participated in a string of seven armed robberies and is currently serving a 140-year sentence in federal prison. And the youngest boy was Marvin Woods. When Woods was 17, he was playing in a championship basketball game for a backyard league. His coach shoved him out of the game and Woods was furious, getting on his bike and riding away. 20 minutes later, Woods rode back on his bike carrying a Tech 9 pistol. The boy who was subbed in for Woods was sprayed with bullets and killed. Woods is currently serving a life sentence for first degree murder. So there's Marvin Harrison's family. Killers, jail sentences, and gang affiliation from his brother and father. So how did Marvin Harrison avoid this street life and even become the perfect image of a role model? The answer is, he didn't. He was just really good at hiding it. Marvin Harrison made it out of the violence that shadowed his childhood by going to Syracuse on a football scholarship after high school. He rewrote the records at Syracuse, being a part of some pretty successful teams, including a six-seed Fiesta Bowl win his freshman year. Harrison capped his career off with 2,728 receiving yards, a school record, in his last game, on New Year's Day bowl game, Syracuse handled the Clemson Tigers 41-0, capping a stellar college career off. Marvin was praised by school officials and coaches for never missing a practice, never being late to meetings, and being the exact type of guy you want on your team. He was a mystery liable, and plenty of NFL teams wanted their hands on him. But there was something about Marvin Harrison that all of his Syracuse teammates noticed. He had earned their respect through his hard work ethic and role model attributes. But no one really knew Marvin Harrison. Even guys who were around him, like Syracuse lineman Cy Ellsworth. Ellsworth told ESPN that, quote, We spent a lot of time together, but I can't tell you much about Marvin. There's a side to him he didn't let people invade, end quote. This is a trend that sticks with Marvin forever. He'd make some of the most explosive plays you've ever seen and then jog back straight faced and go about his business. He kept to himself and no one really ever knew what Marvin was hiding. Marvin would be drafted in the 1996 draft to the Indianapolis Colts. 
He would transform over the next 13 years as a kid from the Philly streets to one of the greatest wide receivers to ever step on a football field. He would retire with the single season receptions record. He would be inducted into the Hall of Fame. He would record over 1,100 receptions for 128 touchdowns throughout his career, and no more really needs to be said about his football ability. It was electric. And while coaches kept saying the same thing about how Marvin was a perfect guy that everyone loved, his teammates kept saying the same thing too, about how Marvin was just a little fishy when it came to details of his life. It's not a bad thing necessarily, but it's definitely shady. I mean, Marvin was a receiver, the spot that guys like Terrell Owens and Chad Ochocinco made popular for talking and talking. But not Marvin. Marvin went about his own business. Marvin was quiet. Marvin was secluded. Marvin drank juice. The name that goes hand in hand with Harrison's throughout his career success is Peyton Manning. Both made each other so much better for so long, and I don't think Harrison gets enough credit for the role he played in Manning's career. One of the most dynamic quarterback receiving duos of all time, they have the most touchdowns and yards between a duo in NFL history. Harrison left nothing to be questioned on the football field. He was an all-time great. But off of the football field, things start to get a little dicey. In 2009, everyone would start to find out that Marvin Harrison escaping the street life that plagued his family just wasn't true. Sure, he had just ended a $67 million contract and retired from the NFL. But quite literally right after Marvin Harrison retired from the league, he went back to the streets. Harrison was at Playmaker's Bar in his hometown of Philadelphia, a bar that he owned himself. He was just a couple months removed from retiring from the league. Harrison was getting his hands dirty and helping out his staff around the restaurant. That is until Dwight Dixon walked into the place. Dixon, a near 300 pound man, was a very familiar person to Marvin Harrison. He was referred to as Pop in Philly on account of his size, and his name was known. The two had grown up together right here in South Philly, and they had both made it pretty big in life too. Only Harrison had done so the legal way of playing in the NFL. Pop, on the other hand, had become one of the biggest drug dealers in the state, and he was not welcome at any establishment that Marvin Harrison owned. Marvin made sure to tell him this as soon as he walked through the door, and the two got into a heated but not physical altercation in which Marvin banned Pop from ever coming back to the bar. A couple weeks later came the incident the whole world heard about. At first, all anyone knew was that Harrison was in a heated argument with a man and shots were fired through the man's car. That man was Pop. Details were sketchy at first. No one knew who shot the bullets, nor if any hit. This is all until a key eyewitness would step up and make this story way bigger than anyone knew. Marvin Harrison and Pop were together that day, and they were fighting. In a near empty parking lot in South Philadelphia, they were tossing insults, threats, and accusations back and forth at each other. But a man walking down the lot would see this and stop to watch. The man was Robert Nixon, a mid-30s age, self-described old-school street hustler. Nixon was past his prime, but he had still seen a thing or two living in Philadelphia his whole life. So he sat and he watched these two argue while he lit up a cigarette to enjoy. This is until minutes later, when Marvin Harrison pulls out a gun and begins to shoot. Pop, who's still in his car, ducks down to avoid gunfire from Harrison, who's on foot now. Eventually, Pop sped off, right in the direction of Nixon. Nixon turned and darted for his life, hearing gunfire behind him. His smoker's cough filled the walls of downtown Philadelphia as an innocent man escaped gunfire from an NFL superstar. By this point, Harrison had two pistols out, one in each hand, and was firing them on the run behind Pop's car. Finally, Pop sped away, 
then Harrison began to retreat to his own car to flee the scene. Robert Nixon, the witness, realized the coast was clear and retreated back to his car, which was parked near the scene of the crime. When walking back, he felt a slight draft through the back of his shirt. He tapped the back to feel a hole, and when he looked back at his hand, it was completely bloody. He had been shot and not even felt it through the adrenaline of escaping. By now, police were on the scene, responding to calls of gunfire. Harrison and Pop were both long gone. An officer approached Nixon and asked what he'd seen. I ain't seen nothing, he responded. An old school street hustler. Wise words. The officer did not notice the gunshot wound on Nixon and let him walk free without any more questioning. What Nixon didn't know, and what Marvin Harrison and Pop didn't know either yet, was who else was in the parking lot. Behind the witness Robert Nixon was a car and in that car was an adult man along with a two-year-old baby. When the man heard the shots start going off, he immediately ran away, leaving the baby in the car. The car was hit from multiple bullets from Harrison's gun, including one that hit a window right above the two-year-old, spraying glass all over the infant. Even though bullet casings at the crime scene were linked back to one of Marvin Harrison's guns, there was still somehow not enough evidence or desire to charge Harrison with a crime. The lack of evidence comes because both Pop and the adult man who was in the car with the infant refused to testify against Marvin Harrison. But why would Pop refuse to testify against the man who had just tried to kill him? Well, it could have been because Pop fired back at Harrison, which would make him just as guilty. Or maybe it was because Pop didn't want Marvin Harrison to go to jail. He wanted to take care of him himself. Whatever really happened, or whatever was going through Pop's head, we'll never know. Because a little bit after this argument, Pop was killed. It wasn't a struggle or a fight this time. It was a quick, planned, easy assassination in broad daylight. And it also took place just a block away from Harrison's bar, Playmakers, right where it all began. If that doesn't make Marvin Harrison look guilty enough, try this. Police got a huge break when investigating Pop's murder, as although there were no eyewitnesses, the crime was committed in broad daylight, and cops found a camera that was pointed right towards the murder scene. This camera was located at none other than Playmakers. The cops walked into Playmakers and asked owner Marvin Harrison if they could take a look at his security footage. Harrison happily obliged and handed over the footage. Only when the police played this footage back, the three minutes in which the killing took place had been stripped and removed from security cameras. The only person who had access to that footage? You guessed it, Marvin Harrison. Police didn't actually think Harrison was the one who pulled the trigger, but their prime suspect was Harrison's cousin, who they think did the deed for him. However, once again, police failed to charge either of them due to lack of evidence, and Pop's murder to this day remains unsolved. Marvin Harrison, now 50 years old, with a son balling in college football, I might add, is still a free man. Harrison is deserving of all he ever- But Marvin Harrison is also guilty of a lot more than he gets credit for in life. Harrison fell right back into the street life as soon as he moved back to Philadelphia. It's likely that Harrison did shoot at Pop that day, and hit an innocent bystander and spray glass all over an infant. And it's likely that Harrison knew of, or maybe ordered, the death of Pop. And if these are just what we've heard, it's likely that Marvin Harrison is guilty of a lot more we don't know about. Marvin Harrison was an amazing football player, and he should be a role model for any professional on how they act. But Marvin Harrison also had a dark side, and he couldn't escape the street life hustler lifestyle that destroyed the rest of his family. That's Marvin Harrison.